Um, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be joined today by Andrew Bowser, a filmmaker who's most recently completed and is releasing Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls. A little bit later on, we'll also be talking about films he was featured heavily in, including Mother of Invention and Worm. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for being able to talk to me today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and before I get into the interview proper, is there anything you want to make sure to mention that people should look out for you uh, that's coming out or that they can follow you on? I think the best thing is for people to follow me at Andrew Bowser Director on Instagram or Andrew Bowser on Twitter. Um, that's where I'll be updating the Onyx release schedule. The next window would be that May 15th, our film goes to Amazon Prime and a few other places. But that's the next thing to look out for is May 15th, Onyx on Prime. I was uh, lucky enough to be one of the people to see it the one night that it was in theaters. Yeah. Um, it was really wonderful to see, especially the puppet work that was featured in it. And I guess I should back up a second for those of you who don't know. Um, it's a film about, well, you could probably introduce it better than I could. Well, I'll try. Uh, it's, it's a film about a fledgling Satanist who wins a contest um, to go to his idol's mansion. His idol is this cult leader named Bartok the Great. My character Onyx gets the chance to go to the mansion, uh, he thinks, to take part in a once-in-a-lifetime ritual. But of course, Bartok has uh, more nefarious plans for Onyx and for the other worshippers that are attending this ritual on this fateful weekend. Um, and an interesting thing about looking at that film and then the other two that I mentioned is they are both very different in terms of tone and plot <laughs> and even visual style, but they all sort of have a through line of this character who society undercuts uh, and may view as pathetic, mm -hmm. rising above their station and surprising people over time. Um, I'm just wondering if that's something that was intentional or if it's more random chance that it's been a recurrent theme in the films you've been part of. I don't think it's random. Uh, I think at this point I've recognized that that might be the theme I'm always investigating with any mm -hmm. film, no matter the genre, no matter the, the context. It seems to just happen naturally. I like stories of of underdogs, like you said, I mean, kind of maligned by the system or considered to be outcasts and maybe even mocked for uh, what elements of their personality might be innate to them. Uh, those, those traits actually elevating them and sending them on an adventure or, or working out in their favor. And um, that's definitely the case for, for Onyx and the other films, without a doubt. My goal then is, with anything else I write, to make it interesting and different but still investigating pretty similar issues. And it is definitely doing that from different directions because Mother of Invention is a sort of lighthearted, sometimes comedy about a character who's about to age out of winning a contest for best invention and he's he's trying to prove himself. And then Worm is totally different. It is, I believe, shot in two long takes. Yeah, two takes. And it's this action crime drama, um, which must have been impossible to choreograph. It was. It was. Well, now looking back, I just said this to a friend the other day. So it's two long takes, and they take place out in the real world in a town called Guthrie, Oklahoma. And we had to run it like a play. And uh, then we ran it kind of like a dress rehearsal out in the locations. But yeah, you're getting into a cop car, you're driving down here, you're getting out, going into a diner, running out the back, getting onto a motorcycle, jumping off a bridge, and the camera's running the whole time, being worn by the lead character. And I, I, I told a friend recently, it was not, I didn't know this at the time, but it was a way to cram every possible production issue into a small sure. project. I mean, I learned everything that yeah. could go wrong on a film, forwards and backwards, by making Worm. And to be honest, since Worm, production problems and pitfalls have, have been a little less overwhelming over the years. Because Worm was all of that, but just dialed up to an 11. 
it's something that uh, you definitely see in indie filmmakers that you have extreme limitations and the only way that you can get past it is by doing the work well, making creative decisions. Yeah, yeah. And just knowing that that any problem can be solved. Uh, you know, I, I you have to really take a weird amount of glee in the problems arising. When I when I hit a problem, you know, maybe externally I don't do this, but I laugh. I go, <laughs> I, I recognize you. You know, I had a problem like you on the last film, and I solved it then, and we're going to solve it now. The problems are going to arise. You've got to be able to pivot and think clearly through them. That is the trick. What would you estimate the difference in budgets would be between Worm and Onyx? Oh, gosh. A fr I mean, a fraction. Uh, uh, Worm was uh, easily, like, under... Probably all said and done, I mean, Worm maybe cost $50,000. And that wow. wasn't just to shoot it. That would probably have been then finishing sound and then, like, entering festivals and... I think like from the time it began, all travel, my trips to Oklahoma, et cetera, maybe it cost 50000 whereas Onyx was just sub $2 million is is the budget. Yeah. We raised about $600,000 on Kickstarter, and then private investors came on board, and it was under $2 million total. Um, and I'm really glad to see how Kickstarter is supporting this movement that not just people on YouTube, but YouTube especially, is this place replete with films that are wonderful that people just release and they put out there. Mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to write about them. And I think Worm is a great example because for $50,000, you released one of the best action films of, of whatever <laughs> the year it actually came out. I saw it pretty recently. Yeah. Um, but because, because it, you only had that amount of money, you had to make it work, make it look great, make sure that the underlying script and the mystery aspect of it actually played into uh, the elements of what this character is doing and yeah. being chased for. Yeah, and I think that's the only thing. you w When you're in a situation where you don't have much budget, and it's not like we had 50 at the top. It's like, I'd get 5,000 here, I'd get 3,000 here. You know, That money's kind of coming in over the course of making the entire thing. But the only thing you can control are the bones of the thing. You know, you can rewrite dialogue. You can you can change things. There was a great problem on Worm where we showed up at a location and there were people there that weren't meant to be there. But I knew, well, as long as I keep them off camera, I could ADR voices in and make those people make sense in the context of Worm. It's all this dance of what can you control? What's out of your control? And I think the bones of the smaller films are solid. You know, they might suffer from aesthetic issues and more cosmetic issues uh, because of budgetary restraints. But I'd like to think everything under the hood really works, which is often all that you can control on an indie film. Is, is there, what I guess, what are the material differences between those two comparative budgets? Because I could see it being maybe mostly the same thing, but a little bit easier because you can afford other people to do your jobs, but there, there might be things I'm not considering. I think for me, creatively, the biggest difference with a lot of the films I made prior to Onyx was that we didn't have a budget to make a traditionally shot narrative feature. So we were always making something that would be described as experimental. So the story might be there, the character might be there, like I said, a lot of the bones, but aesthetically, it's a two-take long film shot on a GoPro in black and white. There's going to be this experimental angle or this style that's applied to kind of make the, the cheapness okay, you know? Same for Mother of Invention. It's a mockumentary, so it can be handheld. It's shot on video, et cetera. And then I made a, a found footage feature called Jimmy Tupper versus the Goat Man of Bowie. Same thing. It's um, found footage. It's all shot on mini DV, et cetera, et cetera. Sound design doesn't have to be so dialed in. So then with Onyx being traditionally shot and being more cinematic in its um, offering, the, the biggest difference is then uh, nothing can be cut. You, you can't say we don't need sound design. You can't say we don't need a score. You know, like Jimmy Tupper doesn't need a score. It's found footage. Um, Worm very much needed a score. But I think the biggest difference is that <laughs> There's no element of what goes into making a film that can be 
cut based on style or an experimental framework with Onyx. You've got to have production design. You've got to have proper wardrobe departments. It can't be me going out and buying clothes for everybody. You know, Once it becomes a quote-unquote real movie in its visual language, everything really has to be tended to, um, even if you don't quite have all the money you need. Yeah, and th there is a... Um a real dividing line in people's mind between a good looking low budget film and a poor looking high budget film. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and again, going back to what you can control, sometimes I look at films, you know, it doesn't cost any more to have a, a shot better composed, you know, it might cost more to have a shot better lit because of the time it would take to light or the gear it would take to light. But, you know, composition is, free so uh, you focus on the things that that can be controlled a lot of the stuff with onyx was props and uh specialty wardrobe a lot of indies don't have the time to get things handcrafted bespoke props a lot of times it comes down to oh we need some satan robes let me get on amazon but one thing i did early on with onyx was when we had the kickstarter money I activated specialty props, specialty wardrobe, and the creature builds so that we had a long runway for those elements that an indie would normally not have. And I think that's why you get maybe uh, a feeling of a little more polish on Onyx than a lot of films of its size. And it's because that stuff was cooking for months and months before we shot. And I mentioned them before, but I did specifically want to talk a little bit about the the creature effects. Yeah. There's puppetry in this. I had no idea it would, it would be there. And then you have a few scenes with it where it just looks incredible. It's a lovely practical effect. Um, so who who did that work? So that work was Adam Doherty, and he runs a shop called Creature Kid. He's based in Denver. But he was out here for many years in L.A., and I met him at a few horror conventions. And the funny thing is I reached out to him just to do the beefy bad boy puppet in the Meat Hut nightmare sequence. And I sent him the script, and he read it and said, well, what if every creature were a puppet? You know, what if the ghouls weren't people in makeup? They were puppets. What if Abaddon the demon was not a guy in a creature suit? It was a nine-foot-tall puppet. And he sent me some sketches, and I thought, well, that's much more in line with the tone and with the Onyx world than doing makeups for all those characters. And it was his idea. I didn't have that idea to make all of these things puppets. Also, from a production standpoint, it, it saved a lot of time on the day. If a person gets turned into a ghoul, you're not taking that actor and putting them in three hours of makeup. You're releasing that actor, and their puppet steps in, and we keep going. So it was also a good production solve. You know, there's more work on the front end. But then on the day, it actually saved some time. And then you lose time because puppeteering is very difficult and laborious. But I loved it the whole way through. And the, the, the magic of when a puppet works in your frame is really incomparable. I loved those moments. Yeah, there's something that is sort of being lost in the advance of CGI now is, you know, it's fake either way, right. but if it's a good looking puppet, you can feel the person behind it that crafted it. Like, look at all of those details and how they're projecting personalities. It's really something special. I know there's no, you know, I watch whatever the largest budget film is with the most VFX. And I'm like, well, yeah, it all still looks fake. I know it's not real. So it's just, it's one version of fake or the other. And I would rather have the, the, not only the practical, thing there but the human performance in the moment emoting and and providing a personality for that character that's being puppeteered and it's not to dismiss the work of vfx artists that imbue their creations with personality and character but they're just there is a difference when uh you watch a puppet brought to life there really is and it's a shame that the way that VFX has sort of been industrialized, yeah. you have artists who probably would be delivering better work if oh, they yeah. were pushed a little less hard and 
given resources. It's it's a shame yeah. um, because you lose that humanity of the person working behind it. Yeah, I mean, there's visual effects that I am in love with, and it's because they were really treasured and treated like a spectacle to behold. And, you know, a lot of the movies that I grew up on was during the time of, of visual effects taking over in the industry. And uh, I love a lot of those. I loved seeing Terminator 2 and, and feeling like every frame of, of those effects mattered. And it's unfortunate when, yeah, when these VFX houses are saddled with hundreds and hundreds of shots and they're not able to approach each creation with that kind of same bespoke manner. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's bringing us back around. This is the, the thing that's so interesting about the independent scene. It's usually smaller crews, fewer people, but you get a better sense of who it is behind the camera that, that's putting everything together. Yeah, yeah, and I've, I've found with this film, doing the festivals that we have done this last year, and meeting a lot of other filmmakers that made films of a similar size, we're getting the response that, audiences really enjoy that they really enjoy your you, i remember when i was at a festival with the goat man movie and someone in line for another movie was like you're the goat man guy and i was like yeah and they like being able to assign a personality to a project my buddy mike did a film called hundreds of beavers he's the beavers guy they like being able to talk to mike and and understand that the ideas up on screen were really his own and his teams, his collaborators, but it, it, audiences want that. They want to feel like they're getting something authentic to, if not a singular creator, you know, a, a collaborative team of creators, but that their ideas made it to the screen. I did happen to watch Hundreds of Beavers just a few days ago. Yeah. Uh, it might be the best movie of the year. It's yeah. so creative, so intelligent. It looks so wonderful. Yeah. And there were a lot of a lot of VFX in it, but also a lot of puppets, a lot of yeah. costumes that are hilarious, um, and it's so stylized. I I can't get on a hundreds of beavers track. I'm just <laughs> I was so excited yeah. about it. Yeah, and that's a perfect example of I people don't take issue with the amount of VFX or animation in that film because it's all so loved. It's all so uh, you know treasured. Mike. It, it, cares about each of those processes and wants them each to lend to the bigger picture, to the story, to the environment, to the characters, etc. And it, speaking, connecting hundreds of beavers to this, it's interesting that, at least from my perspective, and you, you probably have a better view of whether this is accurate, people are starting to pay a lot more attention to the smaller budget out-of-the-way movies. Um, partially because they're funding them directly through Kickstarter and Patreon. But it also, it seems like people have more of an eye towards something other than studio films. I think so. And I think it's happened very organically. I, I think people, you know, there's the big picture stuff of, is there superhero fatigue and, you know, IP based filmmaking. And I, I do think audiences are, are, are fatigued from those trends by those trends. Uh, but naturally, I think people will seek out, you know, art that has a, a, a singular perspective. I just think that will always be a hunger. Um, I, I think if if you are an independent filmmaker and you get out there on the festival circuit, you find audiences ready and willing to digest that that work. Uh, you know, it's it, it's what I guess what I'm trying to say is there's there's a uh, there's it's not like the, those theaters are empty and, and people are, are like why don't people care about indie film or why don't people care about these interesting weird film people do care they're there they'll always be there and um yeah i think i i have found over the last year a lot of encouragement from audiences very naturally wanting to always stay plugged into something that feels authentic and like it exists because somebody wanted to make a piece of art and not necessarily to support you know, a theme park or whatever. In my area, at least, there's a very healthy um, crop of independent theaters. And no matter what I go to, you know, Onyx came out on a Thursday night. I went to a, an independent theater um, also recently on a Thursday night for a very weird The People's Joker. Oh, yeah. You know, trans 
parody film and it was packed it was yeah it, it was almost completely sold out that night um so even even though it might not be clear to most of the audiences these films are doing just fine mm-hmm. on their own terms yeah i think so and and i think uh I have really been, like I said, not only encouraged by the festival experience, but by seeing hundreds of beavers do their uh, road show and their theatrical run, and now reading about people's Joker finally getting out there. Um, it's all really exciting. And, and maybe it's partially why I then don't relate to, I know the big picture industry threats. You know, I know the articles of the movie Business is Dead, et cetera. It, it doesn't necessarily, not that it doesn't have anything to do with the life of the independent filmmaker, but it's almost, uh, I don't know. We're not, you know, staff writers on a, on a network TV show. There is a difference in the industries when it comes to independent film. I mean, independent film, I think, will always exist and persist, you know? It's especially getting better because the technology and access to so many platforms like Tubi and YouTube yeah. has totally democratized a lot of the aspects of filmmaking. You still need to know how to write and compose a shot, but editing is easier than ever. Just getting it out mm-hmm. there is is easier than ever. It means certain things get buried, but also there are creative people who have the tools to make really wonderful stuff. Yeah, and I think there also used to be a stigma around, well, A, I even uh, held a stigma around crowdfunding prior to doing my Kickstarter. I thought, well, doesn't that make me not valid? Aren't I not a valid filmmaker if the money didn't come from a studio or an established production company? And then I learned, I mean, then the Kickstarter was one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done. It plugged me in with my community. It made me care about my film in, in a new and different way. Um, and that community continues to enrich my life. The community that was found over the course of the Kickstarter. And then similarly with distribution, you know, I think, there was a time where people might have been like, uh, your movie's going where? It's on what? That doesn't sound legit. Well, the legit places are taking their movies off their servers. You know, there is no legit. <laughs> the most legit of places is still scrambling, you know, and losing their mind around how to move forward. So all of these platforms are just as valid as the next, I feel. If you can find your movie, if people can find your movie and get it in front of their eyes, you know, it d- doesn't matter if it's on Max or Tubi or Pluto or whatever. And and the thing that I've been consistently surprised by, because I've been writing about the, the weirdest niche of zero budget YouTube films, um, is how consistently surprised you can be. Mm-hmm. Where you just say, okay, somebody put something up, I'll give it a shot. More often than you would think, it's actually really engaging. and and worth the time yeah totally i mean i i said from the beginning you know when i was at uh sundance there were definitely some reviewers that they would they 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 used the youtube of it all as uh as a little jab youtuber turned filmmaker andrew bowser and then they would go on to kind of speak in reductive terms around people that have had to pivot in their careers because the industry's changing I mean, I don't begrudge a critic for not getting their review written uh, in a in in a print copy of a newspaper. That you know what I mean. I'm a 41 year old filmmaker that grew up and went to film school before YouTube existed, and then to get my work out there, needed to put my films on new platforms and needed to put my character on TikTok. I don't look down on any of those outlets is the substance can be there it can still exist sure there's people on tiktok that just do dances or follow trends there's also people on tiktok that are funnier than anyone i see on network television comedies so what do you do with that i mean you just can't throw out uh the effort just because of the the platform or the the way it's the the format uh, especially with how rapidly everything changes one of the uh, the series I've been writing consistently is on fan films, where yeah. when people are operating without the constraints of a studio system and producers coming in and saying, you have to do these three things, totally, they can make something really smart because they're they're given the room to actually be artists and tell a story that they're 
they came up with as a human being. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, y- 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 there could be a better Exorcist fan film than Exorcist Believer. You know what I mean? Like, it's... Yeah, it, it, uh, I recently watched like a Black Christmas fan film and a number of different fan films that are able to investigate different corners of why these properties matter to us and resonate in a way that you couldn't get from an officially sanctioned project because of how many cooks are in are in the kitchen on those things. And I know that uh, this is a war I'm never going to win, but there's also an unfortunate snig- stigma about it where even though none of the people involved with a project might be involved in the third direct to DVD sequel, people will say that's still more valid than a fan film because, because somebody's copyright is on. It yeah, somewhere. totally. I mean, I have a dream of just like going rogue and making a pumpkin head fan film and just, you know, <laughs> hopefully have, having it be like, uh, this. You, you, <laughs> You tortured me. That would be wonderful. <laughs> I would just love to do that, you know? Yeah, when you, when you learn about the history of these films and how they're made, I was just r- reading about, you know, the split between uh, Romero and the other producer, you know, the Night of the Living Dead, the Return of the Living Dead sequels versus the Dawn of the Dead, etc. I mean, nobody knows what they're doing. The people handling these properties, you know, passing around these licenses and it's just, it, there's no more accurate take coming from the inside than there would be coming from a fan. It just isn't. Yeah. They've always improvised. You know, Friday the 13th, entry to entry was a, practically somebody else behind the camera choosing which direction to go. Uh, yeah. Well, and actually one of the projects that I interviewed for um, had a, was a Friday the Thirteenth fan film series, which was using plots that they were going to use in a sequel, but then got dropped. And a yeah. lot of the like cast and staff of Friday the Thirteenth movies. So yeah, the, the legitimacy around all this is really fuzzy, as long as you're not caring about literal copyright. I know. I'm listening to a podcast right now that's about unmade '80s horror films. And they're talking a lot about these threads that were dropped that were meant to continue on. And gosh, some of it sounds so much more interesting than than what we got out of a lot of those properties. I mean, I know I would make a cooler Pumpkinhead 2 than Blood Wings. Was that the name of the sequel or was that the third one? Whatever. Yeah, it, that was that was it. Blood Wings. It was <laughs> almost completely disconnected yeah. from the first one. Uh huh. Yeah, I think the more power that we kind of allow the creators to have, the better. And things like crowdfunding do that and, and self-distribution um, and, and, and all of these platforms that are looking to buy indie films. That's all you know, healthy for the indie film ecosystem. I'm sure you're not in a place to answer this right now because you're still in the midst of fulfilling everything for your last film. Uh, but do you... Has this changed what you think your direction is going to be between maybe doing another crowdfunded film or trying to, uh, I don't know, trying to do something smaller, work with more who are in the film industry? Yeah, I think there, right now, I am writing a script that I think the only way to get it financed would be through the more traditional channels, for better or for worse. I, I've decided to write a script that's just very expensive but (laughs) in the back of my mind is if this thing doesn't go if this thing doesn't find a home rather quickly i definitely will focus on something small i won't let the lack of activity on something make me inactive you know you have to kind of be your own activating force and your own pace setter so i would uh, once i am fulfilled on the onyx kickstarter front which we're very close I would consider doing another crowdfunding campaign for a short or maybe for a comic book or graphic novel, but just something to get another project rolling um, and not become stagnant. Yeah, that would very much be a goal of mine. Right now, I'm consumed with fulfilling the Kickstarter and writing this new script, and that's really all that I've been thinking about. Well, that's a good uh, note to leave us on. Um, everybody, you can watch the YouTube channel for more direct updates on the Onyx Kickstarter fulfillment. Uh, is there anything else I know we mentioned at the start that people can look 
to you for, but anything else you want to make sure people have an eye on in the future? I think right now it is just the next window release for the Onyx film, which is uh, May 15th will be on Prime and a few other places that I just haven't memorized yet. But um, that would be the next thing, just to keep watching. If you haven't seen the Onyx film, rent it on iTunes or watch it on Prime in May. Um, buy the Blu-ray. I mean, we were lucky enough to be in uh, an indie film that got a physical release which is great, again, with, you know, films disappearing off of streaming services. So, yeah, and and then just keep an eye out on all these other awesome indies. Hundreds of Beavers. There's a movie called New Life that I saw at Fantasia that's coming out soon. Um, a buddy of mine, Francis, made a great movie called Last Stop in Yuma County. Just keep an eye on, on the indie films that are that are coming out. Uh, well, that's great to hear about. I'm writing all these down, and I'm also going to be covering more indie films soon. Uh, thank you so much for coming by. I hope that I'll hear from you again in the future. Thank you for having me.